What's going on, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Green with Envy. I am today's host, Greg Manakis, and I got my guy, Adam Taylor, riding with me. Adam, what's good? Yo, what's popping, man? I've been dying for the past eight, nine days, starting to feel human again. I got a wisdom tough extraction tomorrow, so I'll be screwed all over again. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, Adam has been... Uh, recovering from the sickness he had covid so adam we're gonna spend the first couple minutes yeah it's your third time having covid so i need you to tell me a little bit about it because i'm about to go get a covid test right after we finish talking about this i do have to go to a brunch uh because before we talk about your covid quick shout to our guy will weir who last night made the plunge and asked his beautiful now fiance lorena to marry him and he sent out the picture around 10 30 p.m. last night. Your boy was already asleep, but congratulations to Will and Lorena because they are now um betrothed and they're gonna get married sometime in the next two years, I would imagine. Yeah, that's dope though, man. I know who was planning on asking. I didn't know when he was asking, so I do want to give a shout out to Will. And she said yes, because you know, everybody goes in like, man, are they gonna say yes? Are they gonna say no? And there is like a 95% chance it's a yes, but that 5% chance that it's a no is always so fucking nerve wracking. Bro, let me tell you, I mean, I proposed at like 2 p.m. on, I forget which which day of the week it was, but it was July 1st, I'll always remember that day. Um, <laughs> but for Will, he proposed at night, so I'm sitting there all day just like nervous as hell, because you're right, like 95%, yeah, she's gonna say yes, but then there's that 5% that, you know, she freaks out and says no. So I'm waiting all day. Like I'm waiting for the confirmation message and it's like 10 PM and I'm tired. I, I feel a little under the weather. I'm like, I'm going to bed. I took some NyQuil and I passed out without getting the confirmation from him. And then I woke up this morning and I saw the text message at 10 30, but I was freaking out all day, man. I was worried for my guy. Yeah. You got to be, man. You got to be, cause you want to be there to celebrate when it's a yes. And obviously that 5%, you want to be there to, to be there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, uh, it, it's tough, man, because you just, and then you got to keep it to your goddamn self as well. So you don't know. ruin it. It's, it's a tough position, but yo, shout out to Will. Uh, I don't know what else to say there. Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, shout out, shout out to Will. Now let's talk about your COVID. The most important thing here. That's not the most important thing by a <laughs> mile. Like Will's is more important. Uh, I just don't know what else to say. I don't, I don't know his, his fiance. So it's not like I can give a shout out. Yeah. No, of um, course. Of course. Yeah, if you've got COVID, you're going to find out. You'll be fine. It's just going to be shit for a week. And that's all you need to know, really. And this is your third time having it, brother? Third time. Wow. I've never had it. I have a, I have this brutal cough right now. So I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should go get a test before I head out to the brunch. Because I'm going out to brunch with uh, with Will and Lorena and her family. Uh, and my fiance, Danielle, this uh, at Ooh, noon today. So definitely I gotta, get the test before. Yeah. I know I got to because I'm assuming her mom's going to be there and her mom's a little bit older. So um, definitely got to go. But I, I don't know. I feel I feel like I've got this lower octave in my voice right now that 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 sounds pleasing to me. Sometimes, you know, you ever listen back, you know, I'm, I record music and whatnot and we do the pod and I'm always just like, man, I hate my voice. I just hate my voice. And now that I got this like a little bit lower octave because of the sickness, I, I feel like it's it, I'm I'm not going to hate it as much because it's not going to sound like how my voice like you. Sounds like. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think for anyone that does like podcasting or, or any type of content creation, the first big hurdle is realizing that how you sound to yourself when you talk and how you sound on camera are so different, dude. And, uh, I hate it to the point where I won't listen back to anything I do anymore. Um, <laughs> if I'm on a podcast, that's it. However it turns out, it turn I'm not going back and listening. Um, if I have to pull clips, I'll pull clips. But then like, I'm kind of muting it and just reading the subtitles that get generated. Mm. Yeah. I, like, it's not for me, dude. But you'll yeah. be fine. Like, if you, if you get it, like, it's rough. I mean, are you vaccinated? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I had it once before the vaccinations, and I've had it twice since being vaccinated. I will say this time was the worst time out of all three. Um, what was what was the biggest symptom for you? The breathing, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's all on my chest. I'm on antibiotics. I'm on steroids. Just trying okay. to. But, like, the COVID itself was fine. It was just it, it really attacked the chest, and it hasn't mm -hmm. got better yet. So I'm just like, dude, then i got to go and have a tough pull tomorrow. So that's going to be... It is, dude, man. It's October, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, you might as well get it all out of the way now so you're ready for the Christmas period. The holiday hey. season, dude. 
I forgive me for my ignorance here. This is super like ethnocentric. Um, do you guys like go big on Halloween? Not really. Like we've I've been to America to do Halloween and a, yeah. an, an occasion or two because you guys do it so much better, right? It's slowly becoming a thing here. Okay. Slowly, like more stores, like you know they they create it used to just be like a really small kind of like side display in a store you know what i mean just like um a couple of masks maybe there's a little few different types of multi-packs of candy you can buy now it's like you know there's a store there's a, a really popular mall by me that have you ever watched gumball the tv show amazing adventures of gumball no i have not it's a kid's cartoon so i've seen it okay. millions of times <laughs> very famous it's all yeah. over cartoon network but the, uh, a lot of that tv show takes place in a mall and that mall is um it's based on the mall that's by my house it's called merry hill um you can google this it's all out there but they've just they've got a massive halloween store now and that weren't a thing two years ago dude and i'm talking like you got the fucking the decorations for outside the crib you got like all the big robotic things that oh, move yeah. There's there's like, a big trend right now where I think it's Home Depot sound, uh, sells this like 15 foot skeleton that people just put out in their yard. So that over the last few years, I've seen that skeleton out there. Are people like decorating houses and and all that? Not as many. Okay. Like slowly, slowly. I mean, the unwritten rule here is it's probably the same way you are. Like if you've got a pumpkin outside your crib, um, you're taking part in Halloween. Okay. If you if you don't then you're not and then like the trick-or-treaters know whether to knock on your door or not based on the fact that whether you've got a pumpkin outside um there's probably on my street so far there's probably about 10 houses out of like 40 with a pumpkin mm. uh, i'm tempted to go and put some outside of other people's houses my damn self <laughs> uh, but we'll see what happens um do you have a halloween costume planned for you or for your family no dude we're not going out this year like um I might dress up a little bit. Generally, I like to, we have like a little routine. We'll watch a Halloween movie. We'll turn the nice. lights off. We'll answer the trick-or-treaters. <clears throat> we'll get up, like we'll decorate the interior of the house. We don't really decorate the exterior. Um, and then, you know, we kind of just chill. We kind of just watch spooky movies all evening or like kids movies like Hocus Pocus, Hocus Pocus. Okay. Yeah, Hocus no. Pocus classic. Do you have any other classic Halloween movies you watch? Because we just watched, uh, my fiance had never actually seen the movie The Lost Boys. I don't know if you know that movie. It's yeah, like yeah. for Sutherland, 80s classic with the vampire movie. Yeah. Um, so we watched that yesterday to kind of get in the mood because she's not, she doesn't like slasher films. She doesn't like gore. She's more like goofy, um, goofy Halloween movies. Yeah. Uh, she can watch suspense movies like she silence of the lambs like we, we could watch that but she's not going to watch saw you know what i mean like there's yeah i get what you're saying yeah no scream or nothing like no that. no she's never seen it i asked her yesterday if she'd seen it she said screams no. i'll stand by this and i will do forever scream is a comedy is not a horror yeah that's um, what i was trying to tell her but she she wasn't into it i think idle hands is one for me i like to watch that every Halloween. is that the one with the kid from um the stan music video he's in what, li he's in little giants I don't know, you know. Let me have Devin, a Devin something? I know it's got Seth Green. It's Jessica Alba's debut movie. Oh, um, man, I, what's, it, what's it? Stan music video actor. He's the kid from Little Giants. Uh, Devin, saw, Devin saw, Sawa. Yeah. Let me have a look. I, so I'm pretty I, sure he's in, he's in Idle Hands. Devin Sawa. I just the name. Idle Hands. Yes, he is in Idle Hands. That's a great movie. Yeah. Love it. Uh, oh, and then the that. other one is like the original Buffy, like mm -hmm. we've had, where it's not Sarah and Michelle Geller. Dude, that's kind of a um, banging cast there. They got Devon Sawa, Seth Green, Jessica Alba, Eldon Henson. You would know him from Mighty Ducks as yep. Fulton Reed. Uh, Vivica A. Fox. <laughs> that, that's a banging cast for, for like, It's such Hansen. an underrated movie, dude. It, yeah, it is. I've I've only seen it a couple times, but I remember really like yeah. That's when Jessica Alba kind of bursts onto the scene. It's like um, Megan Fox and Jennifer's Body. You ever seen that one? No, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, like if you if you have if you have a week to yourself, maybe <laughs> maybe you could throw that one on. That's that's a good movie. I had. <laughs> but anyways, we're ten minutes in. We're talking about Halloween. 
it's getting to late October. So you know what that means. That means that we're about to start the NBA season. The NBA season is about 10 days away um, from the moment of recording. We're recording this on Sunday, October 15th at uh, 8.47 in the morning right now, Central Time, just to give everyone an understanding of where we're at. Uh, big news right now, and we'll we'll go to a quick break and then we'll talk about it. But big news right now, the Celtics just announced um, or the rumors just got out. I don't know when it actually was officially signed uh, signature on the dotted line, but the Celtics have announced that Jeff Van Gundy has joined uh, the organization. He's going to be in a senior consulting role, a uh, senior basketball consultant. So uh, according to F Chris Forsberg, uh, the team says Van Gundy is going to be overseeing all levels of the organization, including the main Celtics. So we're going to uh, take a quick break. When we come back from that break, we will get Adam's thoughts on Jeff Van Gundy, and then I will give you my own. All right, Adam, when you first heard the news that the Celtics were bringing in Jeff Van Gundy as the senior basketball consultant, what went through your brain? Yeah, it was logical to me. Like, you know, I don't know if you'd view him as a legendary coach, but he's definitely like a legendary NBA name, right? He's definitely a legendary figure. I think that he's a high IQ guy, high basketball IQ guy, and he's a free agent. His contract to VSPN ended. They never picked him back up. Some team around the NBA was going to probably try and pick him up in a coaching position or in some form of capacity. Why not be Boston, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Van Gundy's got experience of coaching stars. He's got experience of being on teams that are rebuilding. He's kind of been across that spectrum and he's seen multiple decades of multiple generations of basketball players come and go. It's not like he's in a position where he's making decisions for you. Mm -hmm. So if for anybody that's like, no, Van Gundy's trash or, you know, you don't feel confident that he's the guy that can help build a team. I get it. He's not going to be what Jerry West has been for the Clippers but he's going to be probably one of the next best things, right? Uh, just to be a consultant, to give an extra opinion, I think sometimes when you're looking to build out a, a roster as complex as what Boston's is this year, the more opinions you can get, the more information you can gather, the more data points you can kind of look at between you as a group, that's, that's going to give you the best chance of success. I don't see a negative to this personally, again, because he's not in a decision-making capacity. Definitely. I'm going to read Joe Missoula's uh, quote on Jeff Van Gundy. He says, it's good to get a guy who hasn't been here before that can kind of have an unbiased opinion as to where he thinks things are and where they need to go. And so he's kind of like a fresh set of eyes because he's not around all the time. And he's looking at it from an unbiased position, which kind of gives us an advantage because you kind of see it in a different perspective. So to me, the thing that stands out with Missoula's comment reminds me of um, the lessons that we kind of took away from his interview on the JJ Reddick podcast, right? It seemed like he, like in the moment in his first year of coaching, he wasn't able to see things from that outside perspective. He was so far in it that he was unable to deal with it. Right. So I think bringing in a Jeff Van Gundy, you, you know, you, you look at Brad Stevens in the front office and you would imagine that Joe Missoula could go to him and say, Hey, Brad, like, give me, give me your thoughts on this. But they have this outstanding relationship that's been there where Brad was his, was the head coach. And Joe was just like working his way up as an assistant. So there is that level of familiarity between the two where things are going to be colored in a certain way because of that pre existing relationship. But when you bring in a Jeff Van Gundy, you're almost bringing in like a coach, a coach for the coach, right? To kind of help him through give him his thoughts completely unbiased, no ties to um, how things were done in the past. It's just what he thinks, where things are and where they need to go, as Missoula said. So I'm super excited about it. I know some people, because of Van Gundy and how he, he's kind of become a caricature of himself as, as a broadcaster, uh, have kind of soured on him just as a basketball personality. But I, this morning I posted a clip that always stood out to me just talking about the way that Van Gundy sees the game and the level of preparation that he um, that he has always done as a broadcaster and as a coach. It was from 2008, and it's an end-of-game situation between the Dallas Mavericks and the Los Angeles Lakers. And the Lakers are up by one. Paul Gasol is shooting a free throw. 
it's the right after the first free throw van gundy says he says i don't like brandon bass boxing out kobe bryant here he said kobe bryant is a great rebounder off of missed free throws gasol misses the free throw kobe out rebounds brandon bass and mike breen says wow you predicted it and mark jackson chimes in he's like no he didn't predict it that's coaching that's preparation Right. And that always stood out to me. That's from 2008. It's 2023. That always resonated with me in my brain because I was like, wow, that was an unbelievable moment for Van Gundy to call that out. And in that level of preparation, he's going to bring that level of preparation to this role, even though he's not going to be there every day. So I'm super excited to have Van Gundy on, on board. Yeah, it could be things like you said, just little tweaks where he's he contacts Missoula like, hey. I think that you know you're you're missing something when you're running this, or mm -hmm. your defense is suffering because you're not implementing this, or your scouting department need to focus more on X rather than Y, right? And that's all it's going to be—just literally little nuggets of information, as you said, from somebody that's non-biased, that doesn't need to worry about what they say because they're not there on a daily basis. And it's just another voice, as you said, to lead the coach, another voice to lead. The franchise, I don't see a bad part of this move at all. Excuse me. It's not like we're asking him to be in charge of drafting proce procedures mm -hmm. or anything like that. It's just, hey, when you see something or when we ask your opinion on something, be as honest and blue brutally blunt as possible and we'll appreciate you for it. I, I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, and it's funny because I saw some people tweeting out or commenting that Van Gundy doesn't like the Celtics, which I never, I never saw that. I always thought Van Gundy was impressed with what Brad Stevens did as a coach. He would always talk about the the like the Terry Rozier team that we had, the um, Isaiah Thomas team. And he would always talk about like the size that the Celtics were able to put up, put out there on the wing. He always commented on the athleticism of the team and Brad Stevens' preparation. Remember how we used to run that um, defense for side out of bounds like end of game situations where stevens would kind of go into that diamond trap and van yeah. gundy van gundy would always talk about that right he 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 knew that tendency of the celtics he he loved that defense we got so many steals out of that defensive setup because um because because of the athleticism of the guards and rosier was so quick marcus smart was so quick in that setup um so I, I'm super excited to have Van Gundy on board and I'm excited to see how the Celtics kind of deploy him, even though they've said he's going to, you know, kind of be in this um, on again, off again role coming in, coming into the team. Um, I wonder how that's going to evolve throughout the year. But right now, the Celtics have two more preseason games. Uh, we got a couple coming up this week. We have one on Tuesday against the Knicks and then we have one on Thursday against the Hornets. So we haven't had a chance to kind of talk about what you've seen in the preseason. I've been tweeting some plays out um, from my own personal account at Mini Minnow, just things that I've seen out of Drew Holiday that I really love. Um, what have you seen thus far in the preseason that's either um, you know meeting your expectations or exceeding your expectations? Yeah, so I think coming into the season, I tried to give myself a blank slate. I didn't want to be like, well, they ran this last year, so they're going to run it again this year. Yeah, yeah. I think that they've moved away from spamming the Spain pick and roll. That was something that mm -hmm. they overran last year. They used it as decoy action. They used it as a primary entry. Primary entry. They haven't really lent into that too much this season. It's been more about the, the pace, pace and space offense. A lot, a lot of drag screens, a lot of rip screens, just early offensive actions, right? Early pitch ahead, kicking the ball up court quickly because the ball can travel faster than the pe than the defense. Um, that's pretty much been what we've seen from them. Their, their early offense, 21 actions. Um, there's some 21 Nash. There's a lot of rip screens again. I'd like to see them run more stuff along the baseline, maybe some flex, maybe some, um, some exit screens or some hammer actions just to get the ball moving down on the baseline a little bit more. I do feel like it's very wing and top of the perimeter focused at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you want to just be able to spread the floor down to that baseline area as well because of the athleticism you've got on the wing. Um, defensively, it's been great. I think they're pinching, they're, they're funneling guys towards Chris Stapps. I really like the double big lineup, but I'm not expecting that to stay. Um, simply because you don't really have the big de big man depth that you did before trading for Drew, and yeah. that you're going to probably want Drew in that starting five. 
Uh, that's pretty much my only major takeaways, really. I think Hauser's been playing okay. Like, I know people were killing him for not really shooting well in the first two games. Is it two games? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he's played three, but he wasn't Yeah, he didn't well shoot well for two. two. Yeah. Uh, and I know people were killing him for that, but that's okay. Like, it's preseason. Like, you can't expect these guys to come in and be at the top of their game after three, four months off. Yeah, not everybody can be preseason Pete, right? Exactly. And, like, you know... Part of me feels like I would rather you not be preseason P because if you're peaking in preseason, come February, January, that's a long time to sustain it to then still have four, five, six months to sustain that level of play. Mm-hmm. I'd rather you take a bit of time to build into things. Uh, but how's the defense has been good? I think it's been overlooked a little bit. Paul Zingas has been great, like he's such a deterrent around the rim. Yeah, he's huge. And then playoff P is uh. He's the most improved perform, uh, most improved player candidate for 2023 24. Most improved Peyton Pritchard. He, he, he a lot of most P. improved P. Most improved P. Uh, MIP I, P. I, I could, I could see Pritchard, you know, like the, the comment on is he peaking right now in the preseason? I know that's not, we're not saying that this is the Peyton. Peyton Pritchard peak right now, man, we are using alliteration. It's kind of hard <laughs> when you, when you start with Peyton Pritchard. Um, but you know, the, the consistency, if he can come in in a consistent role, give you 18 to 20 minutes a night running a professional pick and roll, which is something that we've seen a little bit more out of Pritchard. He's got some really good pace. He's get, getting guys on his hip, putting them in jail, um, you know, running a professional pick and roll like you see out of um, J.D. Davison is actually really impressive in the, in the pick and roll in the limited minutes. You know, I know it's against the the end of the bench guys, but he actually has really great pace in the in the pick and roll throws a great lob. But it seems like Pritchard, uh, that's something that he's been working on. Uh, he commented on it, just his ability to to run that professional pick and roll to see moments when he can he can probe, throw the lob pass or he can take that kind of Dame Lillard dribble, um, probe dribble, and then step back into the three-pointer. You've seen that a few times. And then just the confidence and the green light that we're seeing out of Pritchard to let things go. Um, but, you know, I want to talk about Hauser a little bit because one guy that's actually really impressed me this preseason has been Svi. Um, Svi, when, when we signed him and I watched some tape on him, I was like, oh, man, like this guy actually has a little bit more to his game than I thought. He's he's strong. He's athletic. He's got a really strong base. Um, he, he's got short arms, but he you know, it, I think it was Scal that commented on it. He makes up for it with with that strong base and with that vertical that he has. He's a good movement shooter. He's got a little bit more of a playmaking gene and capability than a Hauser does. He's not quite as good of a defender i think just because hauser's six eight six nine speeds like six five six six so i think there's a little bit more that hauser can do on the defensive end but Svi has really uh you know stood out to me as someone that i didn't expect to make the roster that looks like he's going to make the roster so what have you seen out of Svi? and do you think there's any world in which he supplants hauser as that movement shooter off the bench i think no i'll start with the last question because i feel like that's the most prevalent at the moment yeah. I think that if Hauser has a slump the way he did last season, where it went, what was it, 20 games, 22 yeah. games, where Hauser really struggled, Svi is another option, right? I think Svi can come in and really put pressure on Hauser for, for rotation minutes. I think Hauser still wins out it to begin the year simply because of that defensive upside. Mm-hmm. One thing we've seen throughout the preseason is, sorry, I'm still struggling to breathe at times. So one Same. thing we've seen throughout the uh, the preseason is Svi gets beaten off closeouts quite easy. Mm. When he's closing out to guys, guys will just drive his closeout. He doesn't really have that hip dexterity where, you know, people you can't you have to flip your hips to change direction. And Svi takes a little bit of time to really get his direction fully changed, whereas Hauser does have that hip di- dexterity where he can yeah. just turn and, on a dime, you know? And I, I also think that's partially understanding the angle, right? Yeah. So like if you're closing out and you're a little, you know, just half a step too high, you can get beat off the dribble. And then the lack of hip dexterity that you, that you mentioned with V maybe could um, rear its head where Hauser. Yeah, he, he does. He does move his feet. Well, he moves his hips well, but he's also a really good positional defender. And it also comes down to the offense as well, right? Like understanding angles goes both ways. You can mm-hmm. have the best angle possible as a defender, but if the offensive player knows how to drive, drive a close out and close off angles and take angles away. Well, that limits your ability to get back in the play as well. But 
But I think there has been a bit of um a bit of a leaky faucet type of thing uh, when yeah. closing out. Uh, other than that, free movement shooting's fantastic. Catch um, scoring off dribble handoffs, scoring off um, coming over screens and the catch and shoot. Can cl- can drive a close out himself. As we saw, he had that nice um, that nice jump for that one put back dunk. Mm-hmm. I, I like him. I think he's a reliable guy. I think you're going to get more two level scoring out of him. I think he'll get rim and freeze. I'm not sure there'll be a mid range game there unless he's just like taking one two dribbles and pulling up after a closeout. Whereas House is pretty much a single. He's a he's a one level scorer guy. He's going to give you loads from free, and you might get the occasional Hauser dunk when he has mm-hmm. one of those Hauser games that we saw to, toward the end of last year. But Svi, to me, is still behind Hauser simply because of the defensive upside that Hauser has. Definitely. All right, let's take our last break of the podcast, and then when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about Porzingis. Maybe we'll touch a little bit more on Pritchard, but then I also want to talk about your uh, favorite player on the Celtics, O'Shea Brissett. All right, we're back, and Adam is going to sing uh, all of the O'Shea Brissett praises that he has. Uh, when I said it, I don't think Adam quite picked up that I was joking at first. But Adam, the we talked about Hauser versus Fee, but there's also the idea that who is going to be the other wing that's not just a shooter, right? Because we have Lamar Stevens, we have Delano Banton, and we have your guy O'Shea Brissett. So of those three guys, who has impressed you the most? And what have you seen in terms of uh, Brissett's game that is confirming what you didn't like when you watched initial tape? Yeah, so I understood you were joking, but I had to pull a face for effect for people watching. Um, right, so the guy imp- impressing me the most has been Lamar Stevens. I think that, you know, we've seen his positional versatility defensively throughout the first three games. He's been tasked with playing guarding up at the five. He's guarded threes. He's guarded fours. He's a is just hounding dudes. Like he's not really going to give you much offensively, and that's fine. None of these three guys we're speaking about really are. Um, I think that the the positional versatility, the defensive intensity, and the slight upside of just having a guy that can run the lane, cause create a steal, and then attack off that, which is Stevens' kind of mantra, right? Just controlled chaos. I think there's value there. I also like the fact that he was a consistent rotation member on a contending team last season. Not a contending team, but a playoff contender. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like and, and and to be, you know, I, I think consistent is probably a little strong of a word. He was kind of in and games, out of the, right? Yeah. He was a little bit in and out of the rotation, but I think eventually by the end of the year, he had kind of earned that spot. See, I look at 60 games and I'm like, most players play between 60 and 70. Mm-hmm. No one plays the 82. So if yeah. I see 60, I'm like, you were there consistently enough. You know, 20, I think it was 20, 25 starts, the rest off the bench. You were definitely there and thereabouts. Whereas O'Shea Brissett probably played more frequently, but played mm-hmm. on a team with less competition for minutes. He yeah. played um one thing that I've liked about Brissett, I'll start with the good because there are some good. Again, positional versatility. I think he's a quite an intelligent defender, knows when to help off, knows when to stay back, like stay with his man rotates well um good length so he, he kills passing lanes crazy while rotating. Too. yeah really really good bounce to him can't score at all like the yeah. dude like, and like my outlook on it is if you can't score and you're not trying to score like you're facilitating you're just defending you're doing what the mar stevens does i'm cool with that but I've seen Brissett smoke multiple layups over the first three games. I can't really recall Steven smoking multiple shots because he's just not taking them. You know, it's funny. You mentioned uh, Lamar Stevens playing with a controlled chaos. Uh, O'Shea Brissett just plays with chaos. Yeah. He, yeah. He is, there's no control to what he's doing, especially in the offensive end. You know, he actually reminds me a little bit of Aaron Neesmith. Me too, but nowhere near as good, nowhere near as talented. Um, and that's probably like the Pacers were like, oh, well, you gave us controlled chaos. Well, you gave us chaos in Neesmith. You, you know, you might as well take O'Shea. I think personally, if I had to choose between O'Shea, Stevens, and Banton, I, I like Banton. I think he's a good prospect. Um, again, I don't expect him to play this year. He, if he plays, it'll be because it's the end of a game and it's a blowout or for what, or maybe there's injury issues. But he's a good flyer to take. Really, really good court control. Really good court vision. 
one of the better pick and roll ball handlers that's on the, on the team mm-hmm. because of his size. Uh, obviously, he's got upside as a defender. If I have to choose, I'd cut Brissett, keep Stevens, and then figure out a way to just develop Banton. And yeah, I'd, I'd run with that. Banton, man, he he's so promising as a prospect. I would just if if I were the Celtics. I would get Jeff Van Gundy with Banton and I would just watch hours and hours of Sean Livingston tape. That's what I would do with, with Delano Banton. Cause he does have a lot of and Livingston was like a preternatural playmaker. If you watch Sean Livingston before the injury, that was one of the best prospects coming into the NBA. And then he had, obviously had that horrible knee injury, had to work his way back, but end of career, Sean Livingston, especially on the warriors, there's no reason Delano Banton, can't emulate a lot of what Livingston did. I mean, he's six, seven and three quarters. There was that report, you know, six, nine versus six, seven. What is he? Uh, Six, seven and three quarters. He runs a really good pick and roll. Um, Got great pace, got great length with that little pull-up jump shot. And he can score. He can score. You know, that one game, he had 20 points uh, when, when we entrusted him with a little bit more of the offense, he's going to be, a really valuable defender, um, especially in drop because his ability to stay attached, uh, running over screens and contesting from behind. Um, I, you know, in the zone that we've seen Missoula trot out a couple times here in the preseason, I think he could be really disruptive in that zone. So as a prospect and for someone who I think has a higher upside than Brissett, I think Brissett, he is what we've seen. He's going to show us what he is. And he's just, uh, you know, an energy guy, like a Javante green type and Aaron Neesmith type without the shot, but does Neesmith even have a shot? Um, there's like all these things that Brissett, I could see why the Celtics could talk themselves into Brissett for this particular season. But if we're looking long-term, Banton's the guy that I'd want. Yeah. I'll go Stevens for this season, Banton for now and long-term and Brissett, honestly, I just think he's the odd one out simply because Stevens was available and came in. I feel yeah. like Stevens is slightly outperformed. So, my, my question though, because Banton's on a non guaranteed deal, is Stevens also on a non guaranteed deal? Stevens on a training camp deal, right? So, like, does it does it matter in terms of contracts because Brissett was actually signed, right? Yeah, I think Brissett's on a non guarantee. Let me pull it up real quick. Because I knew Banton was. I knew Stevens was just on a a training camp deal. So I was in my head, I was like, man, does that mean that he's just going to make it because we've actually signed him and the other guys are non guaranteed? I've heard rumors that Brissett was a training camp deal too. Uh, No, Brissett's a full guaranteed. He's there. Right. So, like, I don't, I don't, I don't see the Celtics cutting him because of that. No. No, so neither do I. It's really going to come down to Banton versus Stevens. And was Svee guaranteed? Or no, Svee's Sv- Sv- non guaranteed. Okay, right. So it's kind of unfortunate that the, the three guys that we like the most are the ones that don't have the shoe in to the roster spot because I'm just, so, I'm really low on O'Shea Brissett. If I was Boston, I'd wave him and then tell him to not play basketball anymore. Um, <laughs> that's a little harsh, Adam. Uh, no, I I think Brissett. I was joking. I, I know, I know, I know. I think Brissett. You know, there there are moments that you see out of him, especially on the defensive end. His ability to move his feet um, against Maxi, particularly Maxi, just blows by everybody. And Brissett the other day had a couple of a couple of possessions where he was guarding him in isolation and just moved his feet and completely shut off the angle on Maxi, which is almost impossible to do with how fast that guy is. So there are moments from Brissett where I'm like, okay, if if he ever learns to just find another pace to his game because he's just 100 all the time crashing yeah. miss style if he just figured out how to find one other gear in his game there's a there's a really exciting player in there for someone who's only going to need to play 10 to 15 minutes a game and those are you know maybe not every game so there there is a there's a world in which Brissett actually does fit this team better than banton for this particular year right and better than stevens because Steve Stevens, I like Stevens a lot. His pos- positional versatility that you talked about, his ability to guard up to the five. I, I could see small ball lineups and, and inverted zone lineups where Stevens is actually running the back line of that zone. Um, but I, I just don't know that we can rely on his offense. You know, which is not saying much because we can't rely on Brissett, but I think Stevens' offense is even another level below that. So I don't Do know. You, man. I, think, I think they're similar. Like, I think for me, Brissett's just 
But you know how I talk about single skill guys? Mm-hmm. So Brissette to me is a single skill guy, and that skill is defense. And that's fine. But at the same time, that concerns me because he still takes shots. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? He still yeah. drives the lane and tries to finish around the rim and smokes layups. And well, he's good at shooting the gap. I mean, on, on we, he, yeah, he's, at, he's great at driving the 45 angle off the wing, he right? But he just doesn't know how to finish. He, yeah. finish. <laughs> he gets to the rim every time, and I'm like, oh, dude, that like you're so athletic. Why aren't you finishing these layups? Getting like flashbacks to Malcolm just Brogdon. Dunk them, dude. Like, I don't understand the aversion to dunking the basketball these days. Like, if you can't finish a layup because you're just not great at finishing layups maybe you're over you're over juicing the release or whatever just jam it dude yeah like, do you understand how much more valuable you would be uh, as an overall prospect if you were shooting 40 to well say 50 to 62 percent around the rim just because you're yamming them home you're dunking on falls fine do that and then i'm gonna think you're awesome but right now i am quite low on brissette part of it's just because you know he was bought in as partially a Grant Williams replacement. And I, loads of people were like, you wait till you see what Brissett brings. I've seen it's not great. I'm past yeah. it. Well, hey, um, let's, let's talk about Grant for a second. I don't know if you've watched what's going on with the Mavs in the preseason. I'm worried for Grant. I think he's going to be asked to do a little bit too much or maybe even not enough. Like the role that they're giving him in Dallas, because it's so Luca centric, I like, I don't know that he's going to love playing with Luka Doncic, man. Like Nobody Luka, seems to like playing with Luka Doncic. I'm worried for Grant because I think Grant could be a really good NBA player, but I'm concerned that he's literally just going to be standing there and Luka's going to pass him the ball one out of every 15 possessions. And that's I was it. thinking about it. Yeah, I think Grant will just be a screen and release valve guy because Hardaway Jr. is going to get his freeze there before Grant yeah. does. Uh, Kyrie's gonna get shots up before Grant does. Luke is gonna get shots up before Grant does. Who else is in that rotation there? But so Grant's like your four, four, fifth option on every mm-hmm. offensive possession, yeah. And you're gonna cycle through multiple guys before you go to him. I, I don't think he's gonna excel. I always wanted to see a little bit more Grant in the post. There were some. A few games last year where the and when teams would be switching, um, especially off ball, Grant would take people into the post and just kind of dominate in the post. I I want to see a little bit more of that. I just think like the stagnation for the Mavs offense isn't going to be great for Grant Williams. No, not um, at all. And I yeah. will say that you know when he was with Tennessee back in college, that was his game. He was a back to the basket post up guy. Yeah, like if you remember, he struggled shooting threes when he came into the NBA because he hadn't done it, done it throughout his collegiate career. He was always a post dude. Yeah. So when we start, when we started seeing him go to the post in the NBA last season, one of the takeaways that some people I saw had was Grant doesn't know how to post up. This isn't his game. When it, the truth was, no, this is actually what he's best at. Like he's doing what he feels most comfortable with doing, and that was diversifying mm-hmm. his offense. I, as you said, I don't see how he thrives there with, next to Luca. He's been brought in to just be a free and D wing with low volume on free and high volume on D. Yeah, and you know, bringing him in, they they don't they're not going to contend for a championship this year. But I think teams around the league are looking at the Denver Nuggets, right? And they're like, this is a team that we're going to have to beat over the next three years. So like, who can we bring in that's going to help us beat that team? Grant Williams uh, obviously has had success against Jokic in the past. So I could, Batman, I could see uh, that argument for any team out there. Like, who's the guy that we can throw at Jokic and hold his own so that Jokic just doesn't go 40, 20, and 10 on us every game, which he will probably do to Grant Williams multiple times this season. Um, Okay, Adam, we're 40 minutes in. You're not feeling great. I have to go get a COVID test here. So we're going to wrap things up. But one thing I want to write down for the next time you and I get together is I want to talk about Chris Dapps Porzingis in the short roll. Okay, so we're going to tease that next time. Um, We'll watch on Tuesday Celtics Knicks to see how, how that develops. And then Celtics Hornets. I'm hoping the Celtics don't play all of their starters in the last preseason game. I'm hoping they use the Tuesday game against the Knicks as their uh, kind of dress rehearsal for the regular season. And then everybody sits on Thursday. But next time we talk, Adam and I will be breaking down Chris Dapps in the short roll. Sound good, my guy? I'm always down. 
All right. This was fun. Uh, once again, shout out to Will for uh, making the plunge and, and getting Lorena to sign on for a lifetime deal. Uh, we're going to play you out with some music from my band down here in Austin, Texas. We are called Black Sheep Optimists, and this is Get This High. Peace, everybody.